darkness, against the cosmic powers of his darkness, against the evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armour of God, so that you may be able to resist an evil day. And having prepared everything to take your stand, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armour in your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit, with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me, that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. So Holy Spirit, we just pray that you, you come, and you speak, and you transform. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I love how God leads uh, Denison Baptist Church in various ways. Uh, and when I say how it is that God leads, uh, I mean that in the present tense. Um, as it relates to us in the here and now, God is leading us. God is leading this meeting right now. Uh, God is leading us individually. God is leading us collectively. Together, through this, this church family that we have. And last Sunday, uh, Andrew was sharing in our time of prayer together. And what he said, what he said in that moment, I believe, is really helpful for us as we think about the subject of prayer. If you remember, he shared Isaiah 56, and particularly Isaiah 56 and verse 7, which says this, For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And he highlighted the importance of us as a church family having a spirit of prayer. So important that we carry this mentality, this attitude of prayer within our lives. We should be encouraged, we should be encouraged at how God is leading us as a church family through prayer. God is clearly answering prayer within the life of, the, of DVC and we have seen this in so many ways and even in this last week and that's something I'm going to share about uh, later on. And as Andrew shared, that encouragement should then drive us to more and more prayer. As we're encouraged at how God answers prayer, it should give us a real hunger and desire and thirst for more prayer, more prayer, more prayer. As the pastor and author Jim Simbola says, prayer begets prayer, prayer begets prayer. The more we pray, the more we see the power of God through our prayers, as we pray in line with his will, and the more this gives us a longing for more of God in our lives, which then leads to more prayer. You know, I want us to see as we start this morning that prayer results in this incredible life-giving spirit-filled cycle. The more we pray, the more God answers prayer, and the more it causes us to pray, and it just continues round and round like that. And it's deeply biblical. We see this throughout Acts, throughout the Epistles, throughout so many examples in the Old Testament. The more we love God, the more we know His love, and the more we pray. Prayer really does beget more prayer. And my role here this morning as I preach uh, this passage is not to condemn you when it comes to prayer. How it is you pray, why it is you pray, what it is you pray, how often you pray. It's not my job. But it's also not my job to over-congratulate you when it comes to prayer. Ultimately, your prayer life is between you and God. My prayer life is between me and God. Deep down, when you examine yourself, you and you alone will know, you will know how healthy your prayer life is. As I know how healthy my prayer life is, and there's a, a lot that God needs to do in my own life when it comes to prayer. And if that is true, which it is, then you and you alone will have the opportunity in your own heart and mind to respond to what it is that God is saying through his word this morning. You and you alone have the responsibility to come to God in faith and to seek to live a life that is characterised by prayer. Make no mistake, God does have something to say when it comes to our lives and when it comes to how we pray, why we pray, what we pray, how often we pray. God has something to say from his word. 
But it's important we caveat that and recognise that when God speaks, he never condemns. He never condemns our prayer life. Condemnation is the work of the enemy. And it's one of the primary ways in which he attacks us in our prayer lives. Instead, the Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit convicts. And if the Holy Spirit convicts you about your, your prayer life, you will know about it. You'll be aware of the fact that God is, is speaking in a gentle and loving way about your own walk with him and the extent to which you pray. You may try and suppress it. You may try and ignore it. But that suppression or ignorance will be your simple response to what it is that God is saying in your life. So be open to what God is saying through his word and in the power of his spirit. The challenge for you and I is to be open. And as you are open, I believe two things are going to happen. You're going to hear what God says, but you're also going to know his love and his grace. You're going to be convicted, but you're also going to experience his love in the midst of that. So let me be um, really open with you and, and just to encourage you to be receptive this morning, not to what I have to say, but to what God has to say when it comes to the subject of prayer, in particular prayer in the spirit. And in your openness, God will convict and God will continue to love and bless. His desire is that you would truly become a man or a woman of God, a man or a woman of prayer. That's the bottom line, and it's all for his glory. Paul says earlier in this letter to Ephesians, Ephesians 2 and verse 10, he says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Now, our workmanship often involves a bit of sawing off, a bit of sanding down, a bit of chiselling, a bit of cleaning away. It's a painful process, but what's left is a masterpiece. And the invitation is here for you this morning. Let God do this kind of work in you. It might be painful. It might be a, a bit of stripping back, a bit of knocking down something that you've built. But let him do his Holy Spirit work in your life. Because it will be worth it. And it will be worth it because he has his very best for you. He wants to make you into a masterpiece. Into a man or woman of God. Who has been called according to his purpose. As we think about this subject of prayer this morning. <clears throat> I want us to understand from these words of Paul in Ephesians 6. There's a right way to pray. And there's a wrong way to pray. And this is what Paul's whole premise for talking about prayer here. He wants us to make sure that we're praying well and not praying poorly or badly. So Paul says pray in verse 18 and then he immediately unpacks what he means when he says pray. That's why the title for our message this morning is Prayer in the Spirit. Because Paul says in verse 18, pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray at all times in the Spirit. And when Paul goes on to say in two other occasions in verse 19 and verse 20, pray, he's referring, to, he's referring to the need for the Ephesian believers, for you and I as well, to be men and women who regularly, who constantly, who expectantly pray in the Spirit. He says, pray, pray, pray. And in each of these three occasions, he's talking about praying in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. To pray in the Spirit is the only prayer there really is. We can pray in other ways, of course, but there's only one way that's pleasing to God and there's only one way that has his ear. Prayer doesn't work at all unless we're in partnership with this life-giving life power of God, the Holy Spirit. And it leaves us with a question this morning. What does that mean? What does it mean for us to, to be a people who pray in the Spirit? Uh, John Piper has a really helpful definition of what it means to pray in the Spirit. And it'll be up on the screen for us. He says this. It means that our prayers are moved and guided by the Holy Spirit. That is, we are being prompted to pray by the Spirit. He's awakening it and moving it. And the things that we pray for are being shaped and determined by the Spirit. So it's his power that carries the prayer. And it's his leading that guides the prayer. It's his power that carries the prayer. And it's his leading that guides the prayer. This is what it means to pray in the Spirit. And is it not the case that many of us here this morning can testify to this quote? Are there not moments in your prayer lives 
where it feels like it's just rolling off your tongue. You just sense this quickening of your own spirit and a sensitivity to God working in your prayer time. There's a, there's a real awareness of God directing what it is you're praying for. And it's almost like a river pouring out your mouth and you have this fresh experience of God and his grace and his goodness. Sometimes we don't even know what the next words are going to be, but we know that God is leading us as we pray and as he equips and as he enables. So that's, that's one experience and that would be prayer in the spirit. But then there's other occasions where it feels like heaven has taken a holiday. We pray and we pray and we pray and our mind wanders and it feels like no one is listening. We can often be discouraged. We sometimes get frustrated at how inward focused we are. We're filled with unbelief and doubt and it just feels like we're praying against this brick wall. There's no breakthrough. There's a real heaviness in our hearts. Denison Baptist Church, as we think about spiritual warfare, this is your battleground. This is your battleground. Are you going to be a people who pray in the spirit or who pray in the flesh? And it may be the case that you find a longing to pray in the spirit that as you pray there's a real heaviness. And this is where you battle through and persevere and trust that God will lead you in such a way that you start to pray in line with his spirit. The first question for every single one of us this morning is this. Are you going to pray? Are you going to pray? And the second question is this. Will you pray in the spirit or will you pray in the flesh? First of all, are you going to pray? There's, there's, no, there's no guarantee that we're all going to pray. Are you going to pray? Secondly, will you pray in the spirit or will you pray in the flesh? Let me just read verse 18 again. It'll be up on the screen for us. Paul says, pray at all times in the spirit. In other words, pray in the power of God under the direction of God, as Piper highlighted. Pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and, requ and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Now, let me just be really honest with you this morning. Would you not love for this verse to be your testimony? Would it not be a joy for you when you get to the end of your life? For other people to say this at your funeral, he or she was someone who prayed at all times in the spirit. He or she was someone who prayed with every prayer, with every request. He or she was someone who interceded for many, many saints with alertness and with perseverance. Do you not want that to be your testimony? Would that not just be such a joy to look at the end of your life and see how faithful God has been and see how God has caused you to pray and to be a man or a woman of prayer? God invites you into that kind of life this morning, today, present. It's an exciting life. It's a powerful life. It's a joyful life. Are you ready to take his hand so that he might lead you into that kind of life? Now, Ephesians is not the only place where prayer in the Spirit is mentioned. It's also found in Jude and verses 20 to 21. Uh, and Jude says this, But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. So again, there's this emphasis of prayer in the Spirit. And in Paul's letter to the Romans, we see two really important examples of what it looks like to pray in the Spirit. And also in the book of James, we see an example of what it is we should not do when it comes to prayer. And all of this, Jude, Romans and James, all of this helps us to understand what are three very important characteristics when it comes to a life that is undeniably marked by prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to just highlight these three characteristics. And let me just say, it's not like a preacher at all to have three points, all beginning with the same letter. So I realise I'm starting a new trend here this morning. Uh, let me just share the first of these characteristics. So three characteristics of prayer and the Spirit. And that was sarcasm. Some of you are pretty serious looking at me. The first characteristic is this relationship. Relationship. This is so important when it comes to living a life of prayer in the Spirit. It goes without saying that those who pray in the Spirit are those who have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. It's impossible to pray in the Spirit unless the Holy Spirit lives inside you. We're talking about believers here. We're talking about followers of Jesus. 
Those who love God because first of all they were loved by God. Relationship is so important. And so it makes sense for Paul to write in Romans 8 and verses 15 to 16. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out. It's, it's within our, our being. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. We are children of God. As Paul highlights here, to pray in the Spirit is for you to be consciously aware of this relationship between you and God. It's this constant awareness of this connection you have, the love that God has for you, and the love that you display to God. The work of the Spirit is a work that reminds us afresh of the sonship and daughtership that we have with God, all because of Jesus. As Christians, the spirit of adoption is alive and well in our hearts and our minds, and it causes us to cry out, Heavenly Father, Abba, Father. So let me ask, Denison Baptist Church, is there anything more precious than that? To have this kind of relationship with the living God, one that causes you to cry out, Abba. A spirit-filled reminder that we are children of God. Is there anything else worth living for? Is there anything more important? Is there anything more valuable and precious? A love relationship with God, with the God of the universe, is at the heart of what it means to pray in the Spirit. And if it wasn't, then prayer would become this, this kind of mechanical, transactional process. No experience of God, no intimacy with God. It would be a bit like Alexa, just asking for all these different things. Or a whole in the world, typing your pin number and receiving what you want. But as a loving father, God takes us and God teaches us and God transforms us as we pray. And as he does this, we start to get to know him, something quite incredible. There's this personal relationship with God and we get to know him in a much deeper and more profound way. There's this incredible, powerful Father, Son thing going on here as we pray in the Spirit. Relationship with God is an undeniable mark of praying in the Spirit. Let me just say that again. Relationship with God is an undeniable mark of praying in the Spirit. And you can't get past this first point. There's no point in looking in any other area of praying in the Spirit unless you don't fully comprehend. Unless you fully comprehend this first point. This is, this is crucial. This is the beating heart of what it means. To pray in the Spirit. The Spirit is alive and well, and we have this personal relationship with God the Father. This is vital. In the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, there's a moment uh, when a girl named Jill walks into an open area in a forest, and she's thirsty. She sees a stream not too far away, but she doesn't run straight towards it to be refreshed. Instead, she immediately stops to halt in fear. And we read this, and it'll be up on the screen for us. Uh, a huge golden lion is resting there in the sun, right beside the stream. Are you not thirsty, said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? Would you mind going away while I do, said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realised that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I, if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without realising it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I dare come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream said the lion. Then it's about this church. There is no other stream. There is no other stream. Praying in the Spirit means a life with Jesus. Praying in the Spirit means a life loving Jesus.
praying in the Spirit means a life consumed by Jesus. People look at you and what they ought to see is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because you're, you've been chosen by him and you've chosen to make him your stream, your source of life. He and he alone is the one who will place your first. So understand when it comes to praying in the Spirit, there is no other stream. He is your source of life. So begin with this point. Begin with all that God has done for you. So relationship is the first point. The second point, second characteristic of praying is in the Spirit is repentance. Repentance. And I hope this is obvious to you. But you can't, we can't live unrepentant lives and be a people who pray in the Spirit. Have a look at what James, James says in James 4.3. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. And Psalm 66 and verse, eight, verse 18, we read these words from the psalmist. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You know, how often, let's just be really honest this morning, how often we go right into prayer and in doing so, we fail to consider our own spiritual condition. We just go right into prayer and we don't just stop for a moment and reflect what's really going on in our lives. The things that, that we've chosen to do. The things that we've chosen not to do within our lives. And this is so basic for us but so often forgotten. If our hearts are not right before God why on earth do we think that our prayers will be worthy of God? We are in many senses the epitome of a spiritual daffy, if we think that. That we can just live that way, we can pray that way, whilst at the same time carry sin in our lives. You can always determine the root of someone's life by the fruit of someone's life. And a flesh-driven life is always going to result in flesh-driven prayers. And a spirit-filled life is always going to result in spirit-filled prayers. So God's primary concern is with who we are internally, what's really going on in our hearts, before we even consider who we are externally. The private is always going to govern the public. The internal flows into the external, and surely what's going on in 10 Downing Street would be an important example of that, just to get a bit topical for us this morning. Now, apologies if you've heard this story before, because I, I think I have shared it uh, before. So, But when I was in South America, um, I was struck by a house... Um, that I would often drive by and it had these, these big eight foot walls and a lot of properties in, in Bolivia had these walls that surrounded the garden area uh, and the house um, and this one house was covered in Bible verse after Bible verse uh, and I was always really impacted by that I thought that's just a really powerful example and I remember comment, commenting to one of my friends who worked in the football school and I said it's just so amazing that this guy has chosen to be a witness to Christ through his walls. He's got all these Bible verses. God is clearly using him. And my friend Michael told me, the guy who owns this house, he's one of the most dangerous guys in the town. The police are in his pocket. He's bad news. Stay away from him. And it was just this reminder. You know, it doesn't matter what's going on and how we might present ourselves within our lives in various ways. What is most important is what's going on within our own hearts, what's happening internally. We can do the utmost to present ourselves externally in various ways and in various forms. But if the condition of our heart is not right before God, then it will manifest in some way. It will display itself in some way. God sees through the external reality of our hearts and he looks directly into our lives and he asks, why are you doing this? Who are you living for? What is most important in your life? And this is so important when it comes to praying in the Spirit because there's no way, there's absolutely no way we can take this. We can present ourselves in a certain way as we pray. We have to be right before God. With confident hearts before God. With repentant hearts. With expectant hearts. With a desire to love Him with all that we are. So as you long to be a man or a woman of God who prays in the Spirit, and I hope that's a desire for every single one of us. Ask yourself a question this morning. 
What are my blind spots? What are my blind spots? What sin have I missed in my life? Because we're, we're definitely aware of certain sins, but there's other areas that we're blind to. Perhaps other people can see what's going on, but we can't see. And it takes a work of the Spirit for God to reveal that and for us to respond in repentance and faith. When the Spirit reveals these areas, understand that the only way you can be right before God is because of Jesus and all that he's achieved. And this leads us on to the third characteristic. When it comes to being someone who prays in the Spirit, number three, resolve. Resolve. Um, this is us becoming determined to pray, not in the way that we want to pray, but in the way that God wants to pray. This is us being led in our times of prayer. And we know something of how the Spirit wants us to pray. Because of what we read in verse 18, Paul says this, Pray at all times in the Spirit, with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Now, God by His Spirit, He wants us to pray in every single way, for every kind of request, providing, of course, it's not a sinful request. And this is a resolve for us to be led by the Holy Spirit as we pray. As Paul says in Romans 8, and verses 26 to 27, and it'll be up on the screen for us. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So, let's praise God, but we do not need to work out what it is that we should pray for. We don't need to kind of, in our own hearts and minds, try and understand what it is that we should pray for. But the Spirit leads us in our prayers. And he leads us, verse 27, according to the will of God. Not according to our own desire, but according to the will of God. And sometimes you'll be led to pray for something really big. Other times you'll be led to pray for something that seems relatively small. But whether your prayers are seemingly big or small, in reality that's completely irrelevant. What's most important is the Holy Spirit has led you. It's according to God's will. It's according to God's plan. It's according to God's purpose. Uh, on Wednesday morning, I met with Johnny. Johnny did. Uh, and uh, we met at like crazy o'clock in the morning. It was like half six in the morning in McDonald's for a Bible study. Um, we met for about an hour and a bit. And at the end of our time, Johnny asked that we could pray for Aiden. And uh, Johnny's given me permission uh, to share this this morning. But the night before, uh, on the Tuesday, Aiden went along to a local swimming club. And there was a bit of a misunderstanding when he went along with basically the woman... Um, in charge, said to Johnny at the end of the session, I don't think there's enough space for Aiden at this club. I'm going to have to speak to my boss, but there's no guarantee that Aiden can get a space at the swimming club. Um, so Aiden had went along to the swimming club last Tuesday, and then he was basically told straight away there's, there's a very strong chance he won't be able to come back. But Johnny used this as a moment to teach Aidan about the importance of prayer um, and the power of prayer. And so Johnny and Aidan went back to the car, they prayed in the car and they asked that God would show him favour in this moment, uh, that God would open the door for Aidan to come along to the swimming club, but he would be granted a place in this club. So Johnny shares this with me at McDonald's and at the end of our time he said to me, can we pray about this? Can we pray and just ask that, that God would really open this door and provide this place for Aiden? So we both pray, very simple prayer, we just ask that God would, would show favour towards Aiden. Uh, I jumped back in my car, I'm back home. Within 15 minutes of us praying, Johnny sends me uh, a photo of an email he gets from the woman he spoke to last night saying that Aiden has a place in the swimming club. So praise God for answer prayer. Now you may be thinking, what purpose does this answer to prayer serve? Because it is it's a relatively small answer to prayer. Well, there's a number of things that are going on here. It's showing Aidan, it's showing Johnny's whole family that he worships a God who answers prayer. Johnny was praying in line with the Holy Spirit. And it's also given Johnny an opportunity to witness, 
to the parents who are sitting in in the class. And one of the parents, Johnny's known for years, and last Tuesday he had this amazing opportunity to reconnect with this guy. So again, God is, is opening a door there when it comes to witness. So God answering what seems like a relatively small prayer does in fact have a significant impact on the witness of Christ and also on the faith of individuals, including Aidan and Johnny's family. And this becomes a spiritual warfare moment because new ground has been broken into and it results in new opportunities to witness and it also results in increased faith, a greater expectation of what God might do. So I just want to encourage you, don't, don't be ignoring those promptings of the Spirit when it comes to what seem like relatively small prayer requests because you have no idea what God is going to do in that moment and how God might use that. And continue to pray for Johnny as he witnesses to his friend and to the parents in that particular context on a Tuesday. So when Paul says in verse 18, pray at all times in the Spirit, and he then says with every prayer and request, this is an example of what he's talking about, the example of Johnny and Aidan. That's an example. Praying in the Spirit as we are led and empowered by the Spirit for the big situations of life and for the circumstances of life that appear to be relatively small. Because for a big or small, God is at work in all these areas and God is fulfilling his plan and purpose. So the question I leave with every, for every single one of us this morning is this. Will we resolve to live in such a way that God through his spirit takes control of your prayer life, causing you to pray for all sorts of different things, not just the big areas which are very important for us, but also the small areas, because we have no idea what God is up to. It's only after the event often that we see God's faithfulness and goodness. William Bartley says this about prayer, and he says this in light of Ephesians 6. Barclay says, it must be constant, talking about prayer, it must be constant. Our tendency is so often to pray only in the great crises of life. But it is from daily prayer that Christians will find daily strength. It must be intense. Unfocused prayer never got anyone anywhere. Prayer demands the concentration of every faculty upon God. Unfocused prayer never got anyone anywhere. So pray in the particulars of your life. And Paul closes a section of Ephesians by saying, pray for me, in verses 9 to 20. And I just want to read these verses again, because they're fascinating. It really gives us an idea of what's going on in Paul's life. Paul says in verse 19, pray also for me, that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. Now, Quite incredibly, Paul doesn't say, pray that I can get out of these chains. Doesn't, he doesn't say that to the Ephesians. His primary concern is not his personal comfort. His primary concern is the mission that God has given him. The people he is witnessing to, he wants him to have the hope that he has. And so he asks the Ephesian church to pray for him, so that he might have the boldness and the confidence to be the faithful witness that God has called him to be. When we pray in the Spirit, we pray with the expectation that God is going to help us in the particular mission that he has for us, with the particular non-believers that he has placed within our life, so that they may come to faith, they may come to experience his love and grace. So you want to pray in a way that will make a difference in the kingdom of God. You want to pray what I'm going to describe as warfare prayers. You want to pray in the Spirit then pray in light of all that we've looked at this morning. Pray with relationship, most important of all. Pray with repentance and pray with resolve. And when you do this, your prayer life will be empowered, led and expectant of God the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Let me just leave you with two questions this morning. Uh, I'm not sure, Jeremy, if I've got this up on the screen. I do. Um, so these are two questions that only you can answer. Only you can answer these questions as you hear what the Holy Spirit has to say through his word. The first question is this, how is your personal prayer life? To what extent are you praying daily for all situations in the Spirit? And to what extent is this of great importance to you? 
So I know that's like three or four questions there, but <laughs> how is your personal prayer life? Number one. Number two, how is your corporate prayer life? To what extent are you praying with the opportunities you have to pray together within the life of DVC? You know, this week we have our, our prayer times Monday through to Friday and also on a Sunday morning at quarter past ten. These are all opportunities for us to pray in light of the prayer life that God has given us on a personal basis. To what extent is this of great importance to you? Coming together to pray as a church family. God moves in great power. God brings about incredible transformation in our community as we become a people who more and more pray together. As you answer those questions, my own personal prayer is that God would speak to me and God would speak to every single one of you. You would recognise this is God's will for your life, for my life, for our lives. As we close, we just want to create some space uh, this morning uh, to pray. Because there's, there's absolutely no point in us talking about prayer unless we actively then respond in prayer. And it may be just to yourself, or it may just be an opportunity for you to speak to someone, to receive prayer. First of all, I would say, if you have yet to make that step of making Jesus Lord of your life, then do speak to someone you trust, or speak to myself, or Paul, or TJ. And we recount that privilege to pray with you. And the hope and expectation that God is going to transform your life. That you might know him as Lord. And you might know the love of God for your own life. And that would result in complete transformation. Perhaps you, you might want prayer for a situation eh, or a circumstance that you face. And you need God's strength in the midst of what you're facing. It just seems overwhelming. Or maybe it's just something that's been ongoing for a long time. And you would like to receive prayer for that. Well, we would just give you again space to speak to any one of us to receive prayer for that. Uh, we also invite you this morning to receive prayer for healing. We believe in a God who can heal and who does heal. So if you have an illness, ailment, pain, however big or small it may be, there is space here this morning to receive prayer for that. As we respond in worship, we also come to this table. And as we come to this table, in many ways, this table is a launching pad for spirit-filled prayer, to pray in the Spirit. As we come to this table, and we come to this table with a recognition of all that God has done for us, and it should cause us to respond in such a way that we say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me so much that you died for me, that you stepped in my place for my sin, and because of your sacrifice on the cross, you have given me life and life in all its fullness. Thank you for all that you are to me. This is our chance to pray in the Spirit as we reflect on these elements and all that God has done for us. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. And in the same way he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. Let's take this bread if we have faith in Christ today. Let's take this bread, let's drink this cup Let's be expectant of all that God is going to do in our lives. We all have the victory. As we finish this series, I just want to remind us, the victory belongs to the Lord, and we belong to the Lord. Therefore, we have won in Christ. So any attack of the enemy will always be defeated and overcome because of who we are. We are sons and daughters of the living God. Let's pray and together as we now respond in prayer and worship in these various ways. Heavenly Father, we we come before you. And Lord, I just again want to want to pray that if there's anything of, of Mark Morris within that message, that you would just remove that completely. And all that you have wanted to say through this passage, that you would continue to remind us as we go into the rest of this week. Would you continue to change and transform us through your word and in the power of your Holy Spirit? And Lord, we pray that we would be an expectant people. We would be men and women of prayer, both on an individual basis. But as a church family as well, we would more and more connect together through prayer. And that would result in this spirit-filled, life-giving unity. And that would also result in incredible opportunities for mission. So that other people may come to experience and know your loving grace. We, we commit all this to you, Lord. And we pray that you would now bless us as we respond in worship. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.